And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell. Here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast. We're joined right now by Scarlett Fu in the television studio, Carol Masser and Tim Senevic in our radio booth as we welcome our audiences across our multitude of Bloomberg platforms, including our partnership, Carol Masser, yeah. with YouTube. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting day. Um, some volatility once again out of the gate. It felt like investors were trying to make some gains on the equity side of thing, but that has once again kind of come undone. It feels like this is a pattern we continue to see, Tim. Yeah, it is. Uh, Abigail Doolittle pointing that out on our air yesterday. Uh, the S&P 500 uh, falling out just after the morning, down about three-tenths of 1% right now. But you know what? Who are we kidding, guys? It's all about Netflix. If it's a you know setting the tone for the earnings season, I think when it comes to the uh, consumer tech companies. Absolutely. Netflix shares lower ahead of those results. In fact, you see tech as a group down by nine tenths of one percent. Uh, among the magnificent seven, you've got Meta and Nvidia kind of bucking the declines. Yeah, but aren't we are, are we priced for perfection or not? So uh, Geetha Ranganathan uh, over at Bloomberg Intelligence was saying that overall uh, the street is sort of underestimating the momentum that we'll really get here from Netflix. Yeah, I mean, it still has an incredibly high uh, PE, and I know a lot of people don't really care about PEs anymore. But some of the valuation metrics have certainly look stretched. But again, is that a Netflix issue or is that really a broader market mm -hmm. or at least broader tech issue as well? Um, what else do you got, guys? I guess you're not going to pay attention to Western Alliance or Intuitive Sur Surgical or PP Industrial. Hey, it's all going to be about Netflix. Netflix. Let's get tomorrow. you through the numbers tomorrow. here oh. in the broader market here as we wait for those numbers to cross. The Dow Jones Industrial Average basically about flat on the day. It is holding into the green, but it takes a while for these numbers to settle. Right now, it is up more than 20 points or about a tenth of a percent. The S&P 500 lower by about 10 points or two tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq Composite down about five tenths of a percent. And the Russell 2000 closing out the day down about a two tenths of a percent. Netflix earnings, guys, crossing the wire right now. Your headline number coming across the screen for the first quarter, streaming paid net change, 9.3 million uh, coming in. And that looks Whoa. to be a very big beat. The street was looking for 4.84. So a beat on the additional subscribers added to the service in the most recent quarter. EPS coming in at 528, a beat. The street was looking for 452. Revenue coming in higher than expected as well, Carol Masser, as yeah. the street now getting an upside surprise. Well, it's fascinating, some upside surprise. And you look at that, um, you know, add to subscribers. You know, it's hard not to kind of be uh, kind of blown away by it more than or about double, right, that are almost double than what the street was expecting. Having said that, you're looking at shares of Netflix getting beat up a little bit here in the aftermarket initially. It's down about 2.6 percent. Do you guys think it, this has to do with the company? It's saying thing that are no longer going to report quarterly membership numbers. Uh, I mean, starting but, next year. Maybe, but they also said that they do uh, expect paid net additions to be lower in the second quarter than their first quarter on a sequential basis there due to, quote, typical seasonality. But I wonder also uh, if, if that's a bit disappointing. Well, I mean, just the fact that for the first quarter they had such a blowout number in terms of subscribers added, it's it's pretty huge. Um, the subscribers added was 16 percent. That surpasses mm -hmm. the 13% rate that they posted in the fourth quarter, which already was uh, kind of a monster number. Yeah, it's always hard to dig through these because they put everything out in like three separate releases here. But I think that forecast going forward is going to be critical. They're basically waving us off those quarterly membership numbers. But then when you look at the guidance that they're giving for the current quarter, the current uh, second quarter that we're in, they are giving an EPS projection of $4.68, which would be lower than what they're reporting for the first quarter. And it would only be slightly higher than the $4.54 sense uh, that the average of analyst estimates uh, had uh, on the clock. You know, it's just interesting to kind of watch what's been going on with the stock in the aftermarket. We're now up about 2%. Our Lucas Shaw pu uh, putting out his story on it, saying Netflix posting its best start to the year since 2020, attracting more new customers than anyone expected, thanks to a strong slate of original programs and a crackdown on that password sharing. It's something we've talked about. And he talked about attracting new customers all over the world, in particular in the U.S. and Canada. And that is something, though, our Geetha Ranganathan talked about. You know, keep in mind that this is a company you know, that they, yep, lots of content, smart content, but it's a lot of also non-English language content, and that is really important to the international subscriber base. Two-thirds of subscribers are international. Yeah, the company talking about this in the engagement section of the letter, calling out uh, recent hits like Three Body Problem, and including, um, can't say ratings, but including how many people were watching, Romaine, 39.7 million views, Avatar, The Last Airbender, mm -hmm. Love is Blind, Season 6, they call it Best in uh, 
best in class reality TV, yeah, it is. American Nightmare, yeah. um, and then Stand Up with Dave Chappelle, The Dreamer, eighteen point four million views. So um, more some some data that Netflix uh, t just started reporting. Yeah. You know those viewer well, numbers. I want to go back though to the international thing because it's kind yeah. of interesting too here, particularly on the forecast. They are talking a lot of here about uh, headwinds uh, in uh, the currency exchange space, the FX rate space here. In fact, their forecast for growth for the second quarter is coming in at about sixteen percent on a revenue basis. But when you strip out the effect of FX rates, that would, growth would actually be 21%. Mm -hmm. They're blaming part of that on changes uh, to uh, uh, devaluation of the local currency in Argentina. But they also make it clear that going forward for the full year, these FX swings are going to be a big factor, and they say they finally implemented, or they're going to launch, excuse me, an FX risk management program to reduce some of that volatility. Yeah, and I, I suppose that's good news for a company that's increasingly relying on growing outside the United States. One thing they point out in the release is that our share of TV viewing is less than 10% in every country. We know that for a long time, everyone's been saying the U.S. market is fairly saturated, but you go outside the U.S. market and there's a lot of room for growth for a company for a company like Netflix. And of course, it's kind of the envy of the streaming industry because they do this and they're profitable. No one else can say that yet. Yeah, talk about that. Let's talk about that free cash flow. So overall, their net cash in the first quarter was $2.2 billion. Their free cash flow was $2.1 billion. Yes, that was flat year on year, but two point. <laughs> One billion of free cash flow despite any content spend. Can we talk for a second just how successful this password sharing crackdown has been for the company? Have you felt it? Have you seen it? Have you experienced it? <laughs> I, I'm, I, it. You know, I'm not here to talk about me, <laughs> but I can say that, you know, certainly members of my family have experienced this. Um, but no question uh, that, you know, this was something that for years Netflix said didn't actually bother them. They liked the growth of of the way that people were sharing passwords. They liked the fact that people were um, watching this, you know, widespread. And now just by essentially clicking a button, changing the way that they're doing, they're able to get so many more people to sign up. I mean, kind of makes me concerned about what other companies are going to do when it comes to this. Well, speaking of sign up too, they talk about their ads membership uh, growing 65% quarter on quarter after rising nearly 70% sequentially in each of the third quarter of 2023, Romaine, and the third quarter of 2020, uh, fourth quarter, excuse me, of 2023. I mean, there's a lot going on, right, that Netflix has been doing to kind of change some of the financial dynamics uh, in their favor, it seems. Yeah, I am curious to see what they say on the call about uh, content and content spend here. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier with Jason Bazinet over at City. Uh, he actually thinks that content spend is going to go up a little bit from where it was last year. But remember, last year it basically dropped I think it was kind of like the lowest levels we had seen going back to like 2017 or so here. So whether they need to like increase that in order to keep uh, folks coming in uh, uh, onto the service. Well, the idea here from the new film chief, Dan Lin, is that they're going to spend less on films. Uh, he reorganized the division. They're no longer going to spend for things like Red Notice and uh, The Gray Man. He wants to make better, cheaper movies less frequently and develop their own material as opposed to wait for, uh, wait passively I, for agents to bring over the rest stuff. But I, I think that's interesting though, too, because, you know, Lucas Shaw keeps that, that list of kind of like, um, uh, you know, the most watched Netflix programs and stuff like that. He makes his point. Like, everything that's most watched in there is just, like, old TV shows now. Uh, yeah. Love is Blind? That's yeah, not uh, old, dude. Hey, I, there's nothing wrong with old, kid. Well, I'm not, well, but you know what I mean. The point is is that, like, it's not their original stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not even some of the more expensive stuff. It's, like, you know, old well, episodes of, I don't know, The Office or something else. And I wonder, like, shoot. whether whether that ends up being, because I feel like in the years past, that was kind of what made Netflix Netflix, because you can go binge watch that stuff, whether they move back to that. Geetha said that that is part of their assets. She talked about the breadth and depth of their content. She said licensing. She talked about suits. And she said, like, Sex in the City that mm -hmm. just came onto their platform. Uh, I got to say, I actually went back well, to start watching the old Sex in the City on their platform. So it's, you know, definitely something that moves the needle for them. It's an HBO show originally, though, and that, that's the thing. I mean, you have people out, you know, going back and watching old episodes of something like Curb Your Enthusiasm, for example, which just is off the air now. But, you know, you can see clearly in, when you go to HBO Max or go to Max that it's one of the top 10 shows right now because people are probably going back and watching those old episodes. Yeah, how does that work? So it's an HBO show, but then it goes to Netflix, even though HBO has its own streaming thing. I mean, I feel like that's going to get pretty complicated pretty fast. Yeah, so, so Netflix money, right? pays Licensing? HBO, uh, I should say HBO play, pays uh, Netflix. To, to put it on there. Yeah, H sorry. HBO gets money from Netflix, mm -hmm. so they're, they're looking for that cash, but at the same time, it kind of generates interest in the new season as well. So it kind of, yeah. it's a virtual cycle. But, and this has been a problem, though, for Netflix, too, because if HBO or one of these other companies decides they want to play hardball, then, of course, they, you can just pull that content, and then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they don't They've have a lot of the shows. They, they did it all right. They, they've they've done okay. it several times, yeah. yeah. I'm just going to say, with more than $2 billion 
with more than two people per household on average, they are noting in that shareholder letter uh, that they've got an audience of over half a billion people. So uh, kind of interesting, but again, right stuck. Now? What? <laughs> yes. At this exact moment? <laughs> yes. <laughs> tick, watching tick, this. Tick. Maybe watching more, this. maybe less. Anyway, the stock is down 5% in the aftermarket. So uh, I feel like the call is going to be really important and really yeah. interesting in terms right, of guys. what analysts push. All right, guys, we got to go. We know you got to go. That's a wrap. Our cross platform, radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. We call it Beyond the Bell. We'll see you same time, same place tomorrow.